Oh, there's a crow carring. Hi, people. I'm thinking to make this little video. I got this idea to walk to Mass. I'm a huge walker. I'm a big believer in just getting out on the street. Nietzsche said great problems are in the street. <laughs> Maybe it was great secrets or great events or great mysteries. I'll just paraphrase. So this is my street and I want to uh, just kind of walk down here because I think people have this huge misconception that LA is kind of a wasteland. But it's beautiful. Here's a jacaranda tree often in the spring in beautiful purple bloom. And what I love about just walking, especially walking in LA, is and just minutes away is clamor, the drunks, the prostitutes, the hustlers, the regular folk, most of us just trying to make a living, the tinsel and the trash, the contrast between the ridiculous and the sublime, the sacred and the profane. It's all here and it's all everywhere. And so I love just, I love the idea of just taking an ordinary walk and watching the mystery and the weirdness unfold. And this is the route I often take to go to uh, St. Francis. I go to Mass all over the place, but St. Francis is within a 15, 20 minute walk, so I just thought maybe I would take a stroll over there en route, showing you a bit of my city and telling a bit of my story. Oh wow, look at this. Trees are just amazing. Okay, this I think is maybe a magnolia. Look at these insane. Look at that. Look at those beautiful pods or whatever they are. I'm really into this whole notion of the hidden life, the life where we meet in Christ, the um, what the the ordinary that is actually extraordinary, of course, of which mass is the uber emblem. But um, I just like the idea of a simple walk, and I often will walk the same route here, there, and yonder, um, just because there are so many riches to be found. Oh, here's more crazy beautiful. Look at this. Just up in the tree, a big blotch of red. I like to look upward. Often I will walk actually around Vespers too. I like the, the dusk time. I'm actually not walking to Mass right at this moment though. I'm going to take the route. It's about 11.30 in late August. Um, Oh, here's, okay, check this out. Bougainvillea just cascading over the roof of this little stucco. This is just, you see this all over the place. It just kills me. Anyone can look at it free for the, free for the enjoyment, the taking, in a sense, taking in of our sun. Here's some of it. I don't know if you can see the hills there in the background. Silver Lake, where I live, is very hilly. Great walking up and down. Um, and I've always kind of been taken with this hermit in the city concept. Not that I want to be a hermit and escape from the world, but a hermit in some sense and descend into the heart of the world. This is a loquat. These have these beautiful orange, very short-lived kind of fragile fruit in the spring. Um, this is an olive tree. Speaking of 
walk into mass. Um, yeah, and just uh, an observer, a ponderer. And so I also love the paradox. I grew up in a really big family. I've always had the kind of hermit tendency. So I love also the paradox of being in a city of, I think, nine or 10 million people. And getting to sort of forge my own way. LA is great for that. Here's another beautiful street, Occidental. I love this red wall with the grass going against it. Look at that sky. So the point is, LA is beautiful, contrary to popular belief. The problem for me is people. This is why I, for one, need something greater than myself because while I'm in my apartment, my beautiful apartment, I can convince myself that I'm, quote, spiritual, that I'm holy, that I'm with God. Of course I want to be compassionate, as we all do. Of course I want to be kind. The problem is, then I leave my apartment and what I see is people and traffic. Because this is a very sad fact of Los Angeles. Perhaps you find this in your own beautiful country. People don't drive the way you want them to. They don't drive the right way. I feel if everyone drove as I do, everything would be great. But they don't. And I really get that from there, they're in your way, they're not doing it right. They're not going fast enough, they're going too fast. They're in your space. And from there, we have war. Seriously, it is but a short step. Maybe a few short steps. And next thing you know, we've got drones and we're picking off each other from the air. So that's one of the reasons I decided to quit my job as a lawyer, start writing, and become a Catholic. I just found I couldn't, I was so hungry for meaning. And I find as a human being what happens is, first of all, you fall in love in one way or another with something or somebody that doesn't love you back. Like your heart is just pierced. Then, maybe you start to want to be, quote, good. You find by yourself, again and again, you can't be. Then you start getting older and you say, actually, all three of those things, often coupled with some other deep emotional trauma, often happen to me in the space of a single morning. Who says L.A. has no art and no culture? <laughs> Here is the famed Sunset Boulevard, or part of it. We're in Silver Lake, which is kind of an arty, hipster section of L.A. Not quite as many people out as usual because it's Sunday. This is what I find about really appealing about Los Angeles. It's got that holy hell paradox paradigm to it, where you can never quite tell whether it's the most beautiful place in the world or the ugliest place in the world. There's a typical, well that's actually a pretty tame billboard. Here's a pigeon. The Hollywood Sunset Free Clinic. I love this. Here's the hibiscus and morning glories. And they someone took a lot of care to make these mosaic. Um, here's a cool.
cool stucco place. I love that place. Lots of kind of Mediterranean architecture. Here is one of the many secret stairwells of Silver Lake and Hollywood and actually some of the many of the older neighborhoods in LA because it's very hilly so this is actually called the music box steps and Charlie Chaplin used to live around here apparently anyway these keep you in shape and I just love the whole being able to be have a tiny moment of Silence and solitude are a big reason. I joined the church actually when I was in utter, utter anguish, almost literally sweating tears of blood like Christ in the garden at Gethsemane. I exaggerate everything, but truly I had a big spiritual crisis. When I was working as a lawyer in Beverly Hills back in the early 90s and I just thought, this cannot be it. This cannot be what I was put here for. I started going around, actually just for, out of complete desperation, going, I would duck into churches to pray. And Catholic churches are open in the middle of the day, often. I still find this one of the best things about them. Some people think that see the church as a rigid, exclusive place. But the doors are open. They're open to anybody. And that I could go in there and pray just made me weep. I thought they would kick me out, but no, they don't know. And they didn't, that wasn't it, they didn't care. So that was kind of how it started. I prayed and after a while I heard some words of my, a real heroine of mine, the novelist and short story writer Flannery O'Connor. She said, we're not judged by what we are basically. God cares nothing for gracefulness nor success. He only cares that we do the best with what we've been given to us. I'm paraphrasing slightly, but that gave me permission to quit my job as a lawyer, to be a failure as a lawyer. I mention all this because this is what religion is. Religion means to bind back together. It's about our deepest hearts. It's about the tears of blood we sweat when we're working at a job we hate that we know is killing us and that we're too afraid to give up because of the money. Sometimes we have to stay at the job because we have a family to support. That's a different kind of cross. But the point is that we're not alone in that. We're not alone. And I had always, always felt alone, different and marginalized. I'm like an outsider just by virtue of my temperament. Introvert, dreamer. And then of course, as it would turn out, I was also a huge alcoholic. So I spent many, many years, 20 years drinking. I mean drinking hardcore low down, dirty, I mean, shameful, mortifying, no redeeming qualities drinking, barroom drinking, loved the sleazy barrooms, wanted to be with the salt of the earth, because don't you know I come from blue collar, my people are salt of the earth, and I thought I was being salt of the earth, but I was really just in terrible, terrible bondage. People think alcoholics sometimes don't have willpower, but trust me, we have willpower beyond 
The problem is we simply have no willpower at all when it comes to drinking or drugs or actually a variety of other things. So the beauty of this was I had to come to something greater than myself or, I, or die. That was the point I reached. I really realized if I don't quit drinking, I'm going to die. The real, uh, it was a moment of truth. I, in spite of my intelligence, I was a straight A student. My family loved me. They were a little whacked in their way as to what family isn't, but they loved me. They were decent. They were self-sacrificing. None of it availed me anything against alcoholism. And so I came to, well, I came to rehab. <laughs> and then the rehab, I went to a 30-day rehab, and, and sometime, just being away from the booze, I couldn't drink for 30 days unless I bolted and left. And just getting the booze out of my system 30 days changed everything started to because so I began to see the world hidden within this one we're actually fully visible that we just don't see we don't have eyes to see I began to see that every action has a supernatural dimension that everything we do affects everybody else I really came to that because when I got sober, I had told myself the whole time I drank, I'm not hurting anyone but myself. It's my life. I can do what I want with it. And when I got sober, it was such a psychic change, such a spiritual awakening. Spiritual simply meaning the world is bigger than me. And I saw... For a drunk, for an alcoholic to be drinking is just a terrible, terrible rent in the fabric of humanity. I saw that to do the stuff I had done in the bars, terrible. Um, it's not because it, it violates some rigid, mindless set of rules. It's because we're made for something so much bigger. And when we settle for less, when we let ourselves be used as objects and use other people, it, it corrupts us. It, ru it ruins our soul. And it also, and therefore, it also affects everybody else. It, in a sense, is also a wound. It's, a, it's the infliction of a wound on everybody. I really saw that. And... That was kind of how it began, and um, as I said, I, I got sober, I got married, I moved to L.A., had this job where I made money for the first time in my life, and I was just dying. I said, there's got to be something more. I looked around at my culture, and I just found nothing. I found make more money, have more sex buy more stuff, hate everybody, define yourself by what political party you belong to, define yourself by what rights <laughs> you're, you're going to clamor for. I love the quote from St. Francis of Assisi. He said, one cannot imagine. No, it's not from St. Francis. Um, oh, shoot. I think it's Simone Bile, the French mystic. She said, one cannot imagine St. Francis speaking of rights. Not because rights are unimportant, but because I think when you really come awake, you want to, you, you realize you've, are, you've, you've been given so much. I've always been a big reader, but I mean, I began to read about, I actually began to read the Gospels, which was very strange to me, as I'd been raised Protestant in pre-Vatican II, uh, New Hampshire, waspy. We weren't wasps, we were kind of, we were blue collar, but at that point, the 60s and 70s, of course, Catholicism was just the last thing. 
that was kind of accepted among my peers. I mean, it was ridiculed. It was, I began to see if you truly long deep as you can go, as hard as you can go, if you really let yourself feel the unbelievable pain of being a human being and knowing that you're going to die, the pain and then the, the pain of love that in spite of the suffering of the world that so loves the world and wants to leave something for it. So if you long enough, if you hunger enough for meaning, if you deeply ask all the questions we ask, yes, why do children die? Why the Holocaust? All those questions. But what I started to see is why, because of me, in a sense, <laughs> Not that I was single-handedly responsible for all of that, and I don't mean neurotic guilt is not good. Look at these beautiful lemons. But I saw what was wrong with the world, with what was wrong with me. Fear, hard-heartedness, sort of complete resistance to suffering and always wanting to take the shortcut sense of entitlement self-centeredness look at these beautiful cacti but I just saw if you long enough if you're in enough pain if you've run out of ideas I mean really really gone to the end and just you will come to Christ. You cannot help but come to Christ. I mean, and it just began to make total sense. What it's, it's in a way an answer, quote unquote. And of course the answer is, is a mystery. It's not an answer, it's a, it's an embrace of mystery. But that God would, consent to, t to do the hardest thing is possible, or rather to take on the hardest possible situation it's that you can undertake on this earth, which is to be a mortal human being, that God himself would do that, would come to pitch his tent among us. I saw the cross was an emblem of not some masochistic punishing, this is how you need to suffer. It's a, it was a reflection of the suffering we're already in. First of all, because I'm just too selfish. When push comes to shove, I want my comfort. I want my way. I want my schedule. I want my money. That, and then of course the other kind of more poignant thing, which is just kind of realizing, well, what do I have to give? Anyway, um, I don't have any huge, I don't have a ton of money, I don't have any big organizational skills, I don't have a new theology, I'm not a builder, so that's kind of, actually, it's kind of funny. And then you see, oh, he just wants all of you. He just wants all of you, whoever you are, whatever you are doesn't care about quantity or even quality. He cares about all. Can you see those birds up there? Yeah, look at them. And hence it was that I just, I just, I read the Gospels and really that is how I came to Christ. I cannot urge upon anyone strongly enough. Set aside everything. And this is for, quote, a believers and non-believers alike. Believers alike. And it's for me, of course. Set aside everything you think you know about God, about faith, about your own faith, and just immerse yourself in the Gospels. 
because in those pages you will meet this astonishing, astonishing person of Christ who is so counterintuitive, counter-cultural, no matter what your culture is, he's counter, not against it, not anti-anything, he's just counter, counter original spare strange, wrote Gerard Manley Hopkins in his beautiful poem, Pied Beauty. And that's Christ. Counter original spare strange. You cannot possibly predict him. You cannot ever plumb his depths. He is. And yet, you instinctively, when you get any kind of taste of his personality, you know this is your friend. You know he sees you. You know he gets everything that's good about you. He knows everything that's not so great and he sympathizes with it. And he wants to walk with us. Companion. Kumpane. With bread. So there you go. I read the Gospels. I went to RCIA, which as you probably know is the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. The adult, I had been baptized in my church, but so I went through the adult convert program, more or less. My husband thought it was crazy. Ex, now ex-husband, by the way. God love him. Um, my friends thought I was crazy. I knew not a single practicing Catholic. And I just knew this is it. This is what I was put here for, to find this way, this truth, this life, and then to, to give my life to it. And of course, which unfortunately occurs in this very, very, uh, substandard way here at St. Francis, which is why, as I said, I need constant daily help, simply not to become despondent from my own utter inability to give my all, even when I I want to give my all. I say I want to give my all. My heart says I want to give my all. And then I'm up against me. Um, and my incessant desire for comfort, security, approval, etc. Here is St. Francis of Assisi. A beautiful cross. So here's where I go to Mass often and I just want to say one I don't particularly I don't really participate much in parish life here and yet I feel a part of it somehow I'll sometimes come to there's they have Taze prayer they have a prayer hour the first Friday um, but there's this gal here this Filipino gal Lucy Every month, I get I write for this magazine called Magnificat, so I get free. Uh, I get five free copies every month, and so I bring them to Lucy, and she distributes them. She doles them out to her cronies, which I'm thrilled to do. I, I have my own subscription. So anyway, one time I was talking to Lucy briefly as I handed off my Magnificats, and she somehow asked about my mother, or she said, "What's going on?" And I said, "Oh, my mother is very sick." And she said, what's her name? And I said, Janet. And about three, I didn't think anything more about it. And about three months later, I was handing off m my Magnificats once again. And Lucy said, how's your mother? And I said, well, she's hanging in. And she said, we pray for her every day in the rosary after mass. So, what can you say? The kingdom of God is like yeast. It's unexpected. It's from people we wouldn't necessarily think are our peers in a certain kind of way. 
it's just a total surprise. It's a paradox. I don't get it, and yet, here's another beautiful tree. That's just the kind of thing that's useless in the eyes of the world, that's, that the world says is stupid, senseless. But to me, I think that's what keeps the world going. I think that's what Christ died for. For art, for beauty, for music, for stories. All the things that bind us together and that make life worth living. And that the world, with its love of money, and progress, and speed, and violence, thinks is useless. So anyway, I hope that you'll come. Um, I'm on my way home now, and I hope you all come visit me. When I come to visit, not as Catholics necessarily, as human beings, you have to be Catholic. Because to be Catholic to me is to be a full human being. So, I'm grateful. I welcome everyone. <laughs> and the brokenness and the beauty, the ordinary and the extraordinary. It's all here, all the time. Amen.